Excellency, Duncan, friends. I'm speaking in front of the most formidable audience I could ever speak. I'm speaking about the Archbishop's house, among other things. So feel free to rain down correction upon my, my humble head. To come to Philadelphia is to come to William Penn, the Quaker who created our city of brotherly love in 1682, and it is only proper that he stands symbolically 547 feet above the city, right across the street. William Penn, contemplating his great work, William Penn famously believed in religious tolerance, what he called liberty of conscience, although he defined it in a way so as to exclude papists, that is, <laughs> Catholics. And so for the first half century of the existence of Philadelphia, there wasn't a Catholic sit a church in this city. This would change, of course, and Catholicism would come to leave its mark on our city, slowly at first, onerously with frequent setbacks, but then with immigration and a galloping, um, growing population of Irish, Polish, and Italian Catholics, Catholicism would assert its identity with proud, almost pugilistic confidence and declare their presence boldly, even triumphantly. <laughs> but the Catholic presence in Philadelphia, architecturally and otherwise, could not help but be shaped by the culture of this city and this culture is profoundly Quaker. The Society of Friends, as they are formally known, is a dissenting Protestant denomination, just remind ourselves, that worships in companionable silence, where anyone can stand and speak when moved by the inner light, as this fellow does, holding, holding his heart to tell you the words are, are flowing from his heart. There was no minister to conduct a ritual, there was no ritual, no minister, and therefore no pulpit. Unlike a Puritan meeting house, which is similar in its severe plainness and auditorium-like character, but which imposed a strict hierarchy on the space centered upon the authority of the minister. But the Quaker meeting is non-hierarchical, spatially egalitarian, and in some sense, the same egalitarianism of the plan of Philadelphia itself, which is nothing more than the plan of a Quaker meeting house writ large. This had far-reaching architectural consequences for it gave the city its physical scale, which if you tried to drive here today, you'll, you'll notice that the scale can be best described as 16th century miniature. The average Philadelphia street, all of them together, is just 26 feet wide. But that's just the average, which means many are nearly microscopic. Microscopic, squeezing houses into the compact row house scheme of side hall, front parlor, rear dining room, lighted with a corner window, and a narrow kitchen L in the rear. And in one form or another, one form or another, with minor variations, here was a planning logic that has carried across the centuries, adapted to the strict armature of lot size, but then multiplied again and again to make block long rows with no more variety than that of a metronome. All these factors, the tight scale, the, the Quaker insistence on plainness, the reliance on brick, have in given Philly, Philadelphia its consistency, a consistency that is stupefying. There below in the lower right is a post-war house in Northeast Philadelphia where I lived in the mid-1960s and I look at it, it carries the architectural DNA of its 17th century ancestors. But this is the mystery of Philadelphia. How is it with all these constraints of scale, materials, the inhibitions of local custom, the Quaker dread of extravagance, that it didn't destroy architectural creativity? On the other hand, they acted to enhance it. Philadelphia has produced more than its share of architectural prodigies. Louis Kahn, Robert Venturi, Frank Furness, all of whom contended with Philadelphia's peculiar character to make buildings of heroic vitality. Now remember, the armature of wires around a bonsai plant does not kill the plant, but makes it flourish. But the flip side of the Quaker insistence on plainness is their willingness to tolerate the blunt expression of unadored, unadorned architectural fact, what Venturi called the ugly and the ordinary. And it's on this rocky soil that Philadelphia's Catholic architecture sprouted 
and blossomed. Here, your grace is your cathedral, mighty and proud, proclaiming itself, but not with, not with swaggering arrogance. I propose with something more akin to the cautious stance of a boxer rising to his feet, to quote Rocky again, having been flung to the mat, but not knocked out, catching his breath and returning to the fight. I'll tell you about the fight. The, the self-assertion you see here was hard won. It took 50 years for Philadelphia to build its first Catholic church, that quiet little sanctuary we, we know. And if you don't know it, you should go and see it, St. Joseph's. It was built in 1733, but nothing of the original building fabric remains. All that remains is its site. To see those cast iron columns and that splendid ionic reredos, I say it's splendid, Duncan might correct me later, is to know you're looking at the renovations of 1838. It also had a distinguished organist. From 1839 to 1842, the organist was Napoleon Lebrun, the architect of the cathedral. It has the character of a gentle, rather intimate refuge, which in a way it is, because the church is approached by an alley leading to a still smaller alley. The building is as circumspect as it could be. Much like a European synagogue of the 18th century, it seems to have been deliberately been tucked out of sight so as not to provoke the majority population. And as it happened, they had good reason to worry. But by this time, of course, Quakers were no longer a majority in Philadelphia. Even William Penn's sons converted to Anglicanism, those upward strivers. And by, I mean that kindly. And, and by 1756, the skyline of the city was dominated by that defiantly unquaker form, the steeple of various Anglican, Presbyterian, Dutch Calvinist, Lutheran churches. All the various denominations afforded Penn's liberty of conscience, but not Catholics. No steeples yet. When Old St. Mary's was built, 30 years after St. Joseph's, it now dared to present itself on the street, on 4th Street, if in modest fashion. For a brief time after 1810, this was the Catholic Cathedral of Philadelphia, which is when they added the present facade in that boxy, linear, neoclassical Gothic of the era. But the status of Catholics had now changed. Worshiping Catholics were members of the Continental Congress, who worshiped here, and later both presidents, Washington and John Adams, would visit uh, during their terms. Now the parishioners of St. Mary's were typically Anglo-Catholics and a smidgen of French and German Catholics, relatively small in number. Not till 1789 did Philadelphia's German Catholics build a church for themselves, Holy Trinity, a distinctly conservative building, uh, a late Georgian essay in the early Georgian, which means it's not good. but. <laughs> Uh, a, few, a few years later, a far more fashionable church was built. The architect was the elusive Nicholas Fagan, an Irish emigre from Dublin about whom we know virtually nothing. And this was the church of St. Augustine. And it has the abstract plenarity of the contemporary work of John Soane, which Fagan may have seen. Think away the central tower that was added by William Strickland in 1829. So these four churches served a city at this point in 1800 with about 41,000 inhabitants. But by 1840, the population was 90,000, and the largest percentage of the new arrivals were Catholic, heavily Irish. They needed churches, particularly in those waterfront areas where there was work for Irish laborers. Among the new churches were a a pair by a 20-year-old architect, that child prodigy Napoleon Lebrun, St. Patrick and St. Philip de Neri. Both were built in 1841, although it's really the same church done twice. That's okay. Uh, a a paper-thin abstraction of a Greek temple. But this influx, this cascade, a torrent of Irishmen did not sit well with native-born Protestant Philadelphians who called themselves with no sense of irony, Native Americans. We now have the specter of openly expressed, unabashed public bigotry. 
I looked in the Philadelphia papers online. This is ju these are a few ads from 1848, 1849. I looked under the search term, no Irish need apply. If you're Irish, you can't be a bartender, you can't be a cook, you can't, you can't uh, be a babysitter. And what's astonishing about this, to me at least, we, we tend to think of 19th century as a less enlightened version of our world, prejudiced against blacks and foreigners, especially non-English speakers. But look at these ads. In the Philadelphia of the 1840s, you were more acceptable if you were French, German, or even black than if you were Irish. Tensions mounted in early 1844 when your excellency's predecessor, Bishop Kenrick, um, along with leading Catholics, including Michael Bouvier, great-great-grandfather of Jackie Kennedy, petitioned the Philadelphia School Board to exempt Catholic children from having to sing Protestant hymns, recite Protestant prayers, and read from Protestant translations of the Bible. The reaction of the native Protestants was swift and furious. On May 8th, 1844, 2.30 p.m., a mob of about 300 gathered outside the church of St. Michael in Kensington and were permitted by the captain of the militia to enter the church, which was promptly burned to the ground. That was 2.30. 4 p.m., the mob had moved to Second and Phoenix Street, it was then called, which had just been vacated by the Sisters of Charity, where it was rumored that the Irish had stockpiled arms. It, too, was burned to the ground. But as it burned, the mob now turned its attention to a much more important target, St. Augustine. Now, the first two buildings that were burned were outside the original city limits of Philadelphia. Philadelphia wasn't consolidated till 1854, which meant they were under their local police protection, not the police protection of the city of Philadelphia. When the mayor of Philadelphia heard that St. Augustine was the target, he was alarmed and he hastily arrived on horseback to address the mob. When was the last time an American mayor arrived on horseback anywhere? I love the image. Uh, there was a standoff for a few hours, but just before 10 p.m., a 14-year-old boy managed to break into the church vestibule, light a fire, and St. Augustine's also fell to the flames. These were only the church buildings destroyed that night. A dozen or so houses were destroyed, vandalized. There were perhaps 20 deaths. But as it happened, this was the high water mark of the anti-Catholic tide. Rather than drawing with, with them the, Prot the Protestant majority to the nativist cause, the, um, it backfired. The city reacted to the violence, to the awful riots, as they were called, with shame and revulsion. A second riot later that summer damaged but did not destroy the Church of St. Philip Denary in South Philadelphia because the city's authorities had learned in the meantime how to quell the disturbance, which mean, meant they had to act swiftly and in force. Now began the mournful task of clearing the ruins and rebuilding. Both burnout churches were little more than shells, but in each case they were rebuilt on the exact same footprint. Inevitably, the work was entrusted now, who else, Napoleon Lebrun, in a pattern that we will see throughout the history of Philadelphia, that a single architect will enjoy something close to a monopoly on Catholic patronage. Using the same foundations, he rebuilt St. Augustine while updating it stylistically, mildly in the process, exchanging the cubic neoclassical severity of the original for something much more festive and Italianate in character. But this and the rebuilding of St. Michael's were the easy tasks confronting Bishop Kenrick, who had been the proximate cause, after all, of the riots with his complaint that the Philadelphia school system did not give Catholic pupils a chance to opt out of Protestant prayers and hymns. That problem remained. For Bishop Kenrick, the only prudent solution was to stop forcing the issue and to establish a parallel system of parochial schools, which would be completed by his successor, Bishop Newman. But the bishop did not advocate a wholesale retreat from the public life of the city. On the contrary, he resolved to give it a more vivid symbol of the Catholic presence and in the most forceful and tangible way possible by building a cathedral. But how? What style? The logical model was found in Germany where another minority Catholic population in the Rhineland found themselves dominated by their Protestant rulers who had acquired the Rhineland after the defeat of Napoleon. 
For the German Catholics, the most muscular instrument for asserting Catholic national identity was Gothic architecture. After all, the greatest of all Gothic cathedrals is Cologne Cathedral, left half finished at the end of the Middle Ages, but now, beginning in 1842, German Catholics begin the colossal task of completing the Leviathan, something to flaunt in the face of their Prussian overlords. So there was a per persuasive case for making a Gothic cathedral redolent of a pre-Reformation, almost universally Catholic Europe. So pers persuasive was the case that this is exactly what was done in New York a decade later with St. Patrick's but not for Bishop Kenrick, who was no fan of Gothic architecture. In his formative years, 1818 to 1821, he trained in that decidedly un-Gothic, non-Gothic, anti-Gothic city, Rome, at the Pontifical <laughs> University, where he acquired his lifelong love for the architecture of the Roman Renaissance, especially its long barrel vaulted basilicas. This, he decided, was the appropriate model for his new cathedral. So in plan, it is a basilica with a transept and a semicircular apse. We've got a much larger one now. It was extended in 1957. Inevitably, he employed as his architect, Napoleon Lebrun, now in the throes of recreating the, the whole physical fabric of Philadelphia Catholicism. He was only 26 years old. I wish I could show you a portrait of him in his youthful prime, but all I can show you is the old man. Uh, project him backwards mentally. <laughs> Lebrun's design was a conflation of several of Rome's 16th century churches, including San Carlo al Corso and the Church of the Gesù, which had been copied so many times and imitated so often that it was no longer even a matter of copying, for it offered a kind of flexible vernacular. The dimensions are mighty with the deep thrust of the nave, originally 216 feet long, the nave 50 feet wide, and above, a deeply coffered barrel vault carried on massive piers which give it, give it its colossal processional rhythm and its sense of, sense of stately dignity, which those of you who were at the mass and saw it for the first time, I think will acknowledge. It's got a magnificent stride as those piers march down, altar words. Unlike most buildings in the country, one newspaper noted, there are no side windows, and all the light is introduced from above, either from the lunettes in the Clara story or from the oculus crowning the dome over each of the bays of the side aisle. As a result, from the exterior, the aisle, while, aisle walls are blind. Think away that chapel, later edition. This gives the exterior kind of forbidding austerity According to Im immemorial oral tradition, this is the legacy of the 1844 riots. Windows placed just above the point where you could easily fling a stone. Unprovable, but I like to think it's probably true. I, I, I suspect it's true. Five years into construction, and the construction lasted 18 years, from 1846 to 1864, Napoleon Le Lebrun is discharged. It's not clear why. There was a change of bishop from Kenrick to Bishop Newman. And a series of other architects were interviewed for the solution of the church facade. And this is the design submitted by Thomas Eustick Walter, who was just about to put the dome on the US Capitol. But for some reason, Walter's design was rejected. And what we got instead was that of John Notman, who was neither Walter nor Notman were Catholics. It seemed more important to get a, an obedient, complacent architect than a Catholic. And what he submitted then is essentially what is built now except for the two side towers, like St. Peter's in Rome. Those little diminutive campanile uh, were subtracted at the last minute. It's built of Connecticut and New Jersey brownstone and is the largest brownstone object in the city of Philadelphia. Lebrun, I suppose with his tail between his legs, went on to build Philadelphia's Academy of Music right thereafter, among other buildings, opening the door to Catholic patronage. And just at this moment of Lebrun's downfall, there arrived yet again from Dublin, an Irishman named John Thomas Mahoney. And there you see as built. So 
So while Lebrun is out of the picture, Notman the Protestant is building the cathedral, John Mahoney gets to build everything in Catholic Philadelphia for a decade. We're not sure how he, be, he, he realized the, the successful timing. What happened, he submitted a design for the orphan asylum at 43rd and Lancaster, which is out in West Philadelphia. There you see the building upon its completion. And uh, for the next decade, till his premature death in 1864, he designed church upon church upon church, so many, he tells us, that he couldn't even list them all at the bottom for reasons of want of space. Uh, do we call that humble bragging? I don't know. These churches are almost all gone because they tended to be modest in size. All, almost all of them were replaced with the wave of immigration within the next 50 years. When Mahoney died in 1864, once again, it opened the door for an aspiring Catholic architect, but it would not be Lebrun. He returned to complete the cathedral and to build its dome, upon which he promptly detrained to New York City. But as it happened, there was another Catholic contender quietly waiting in the wings, Edwin Forrest Durang. Uh, oh, there's, you know, there's the church as finished in 1864, in a lithograph, colored lithograph. Uh, Edwin For Forrest Durang, if you know the name Edwin Forrest, great American actor, came from a prominent American family, a uh, the theatrical family, actors. In fact, it's a great, great, I believe great, 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 great grandson, Christopher Durang, the, the playwright. And he enters the field of architecture in 1851, and for the first decade, he does virtually nothing Catholic. His connections in the theatrical world lead him to think he'll have a career as a theater architect. He submitted a design for the Academy of Music, a little overwrought and a little verbose, but, but not, not bad. Uh, he was born in 1829. Um, and the, the buildings he built, we would not give a second look to. They're, they're Italianate conventional things, like this armory, which once stood on Race Street, built, quote, for all kinds of exhibition halls or concerts, conventions, and other large public meetings. The newspaper said if used as a ballroom, its great drill room could seat 1,800 people. And to carry the floor, it required massive trust, 10 massive trust girders. The most power, the powerful, said the paper, that had ever been put in a building of this type being 60 foot span, seven feet deep. So in consolation for its demolition, at least we have a photograph of those powerful trust girders. In other words, he's good at making theatrical type buildings, capacious halls, massively built. And here in embryonic form was the solution for all of Durang's subsequent churches and theaters. A clear open span under a mighty trust roof carrying a plaster ceiling of segmental form, quote, divided into compartments and then tastefully frescoed. Durang showed no great interest in Catholic church architecture till Mahoney left the stage. Then he made his debut with a pair of churches uh, that still survive, St. Anne and St. Charles Borromeo. Each was a stone leviathan with a sculptural prodigy of a facade. That at St. Anne's, Port Richmond, on the left, had a Baroque portal with Corinthian columns projecting boldly, madly, before the triple portals of the entrance, their movement repeated with vigorous breaks in the entablature above to ascend into triumphal urns. It was not terribly original. If anything, it's a high Victorian paraphrase of the facade of the cathedral itself, but exchanging the Renaissance clarity of the cathedral for, uh, for something modeled in depth and restlessly agitated. But even more agitated was St. Charles Borromeo with its uneven pair of flailing towers. The taller of the two on the right doesn't even look like buildable construction with those impossibly spindly columns. Looks more like a child's fanciful drawing of imaginary architecture than something meant to be rendered in stone and mortar. But these two churches in prominent locations led to other commissions, and they were followed by other churches, including the central one, St. Thomas at Villanova. And now 
do ranks practice burgeons? By, at this moment, in 1876, there were now 43 Catholic churches in Philadelphia. We're just on the moment where, where, where the great wave is about to begin. Durang did, um, had done almost half of them. Far fewer, you'll see, than the Episcopalians in, in Philadelphia. But this is changing because now the great age of immigration is dawning. And there now came church upon church upon church. Romanesque, Gothic, classical, in Durang's frenzy of inventiveness. By the, in the 1880s, his output became prodigious. Well, now I'm just getting silly. But in for a penny, in for a pound. So if we add in the countless schools, hospitals, rectories, convents by Durang, the number of Catholic objects he created becomes stupefying. The fact is, if you grew up in Philadelphia, or born here, you were likely baptized in one of his churches. I was in St. Dominic's. Attended one of his parochial schools. Were sick in one of his hospitals. Will be buried from another of his churches. We speak today of a healthy life-work balance, but Durang would have thought that was a foolish phrase. <laughs> Weren't they the same thing, life and work? Now, Durang was no slacker. We find him still working at the age of 86 and working actively. On the morning of June 12, 1911, in fact, we find him visiting the church of St. Monica, which he had designed a decade earlier. Um, with, suddenly I realized I said 1829, he was born 1825, so he's 86, uh, 1811. He went there to pace the site of its new, the, the footprint of its new convent that he was about to build, but he left the Monsignor in a hurry, explaining that his daughter was getting married that afternoon. He walked out the door, walked one block in the hot June sun, and collapsed on the sidewalk. He did not make it to his daughter's wedding, which went on without him which I, I, I find appropriate. May we all die in harness, someday. <laughs> For half a century, Durang controlled the architecture of Catholic Philadelphia, a denominational monopoly that no other archi American architect has known or probably ever will. Sorry, Duncan. <laughs> that this, this is not to say, though, that he was a great architect or even a good one but he made the most of his limitations. And what we now see as his faults, what we now see as his faults were to his loyal patrons, his greatest assets. St. Anne and St. Charles Borromeo established the model that Durang would follow without significant modifications for the rest of his career. That is, a spirited frontispiece, plain but solid walls to the side, and between them a roomy, roomy auditorium of a space. Strangely, with Durang, and that's Nativity of Blessed Virgin Mary in the upper left, strangely, the agitation stops as, stops as soon as you come to the edge of the facade, which seems almost to be a freestanding object, something to be slid into place and clicked into position, or slid back out again when no longer needed, mm -hmm. uh, as happened to St. Anne's when a fire uh, burned it in 18, 1947. But behind the turbulence of the hyperactive facade was a space shaped for the maximum clarity of sight and sound. They were built to hold enormous crowds, but even so, there was frequently standing room only, and so I remember from the, the 1960s. A typical specimen was Our Lady of the Visitation, 1876, a twin-towered Gothic Goliath with a capacity of 1,300. St. Francis Xavier was even larger, seating 1,370, another 80 in the gallery. In, space, in spatial terms, there was virtually no difference between a Durang church and a Durang auditorium, of which he designed numerous examples, like this one in York, PA. Each was a capacious space of gathering, clear lines of sight and vision, its seats or pews facing a raised stage or altar. When he added galleries, as he did at St. Charles Borromeo, the resemblance to an auditorium was even stronger. Now, this cascade of commissions was made possible, as we saw, with the fantastic increase in immigration, which by 1886 had made Catholics the single largest religious body in the United States. Now, the immigrants were divided by language, national origin, and by custom, 
which meant that their churches would not look the same. So for Italian Philadelphia, Durang built a church that was instantly recognizable as Italian, Maria Magdalene de Pazzi. It is a tight and appealing classical essay, perhaps too much window and too little wall. I'll have to ask Duncan later about that. And it would be very well balanced were it not for that curious afterthought of a tower. It is odd. And if Durang had built the church as he intended, it would have been even odder. It makes no sense, but it makes a lot of sense if you think about the physical order of Philadelphia, which is profoundly a city of three-story houses. And the spire is the flagpole rising above the encampment that we know as a parish. But it's not enough that the spire tells you where you are, it must also tell you who you are. If you're German Catholic, not surprisingly, you got Gothic. However, if you were Irish, you typically got Romanesque, St. Francis Xavier here. For some reason, it seems that Irish Philadelphia was allergic to the Gothic, perhaps because it had been co-opted by the, their Anglican oppressors. I'm thinking of St. Mark's down the street here, or Holy Trinity. Polish churches had the alternative of being either Renaissance or Gothic. This is during St. Laurentius, the first church in the city built for a Polish congregation. But Gothic churches posed a particular problem for Durang, especially when they were of basilical form. That is, arranged in three aisles with a central nave, two lower side aisles, divided by rows of columns, as at St. James. This was my church in graduate school. This violated Durang's impulse to make his churches as auditorium-like as possible. The idea of columns dividing aisle from nave was reprehensible. Everything in him pushed towards auditorium character. So in St. James, he shrinks the columns to virtual nothingness, as slender as pipes. And in a sense, they were pipes, since he used cast iron columns grouped in spindly shafts and grain to simulate granite. But I think the columns still bugged him. The next step was to get rid of them entirely. And that's what he did at the church I went to in college. This is our mother of good, lady of good counsel at Bryn Mawr, where he suspended the Clara story on internal steel beams so that no columns were necessary. But he leaves behind the florid capitals. Beneath the Clara story, vestigial ghosts dangling in midair as if resting on hypothetical columns. And as with his National Guard's armory 40 years earlier, Durang was keen to use efficient modern construction to make a roomy, spacious hall, and utterly indifferent to the artistic expression of that construction. Now, such was my take on Durang, a theatrical architect from a theatrical family whose buildings were very often theaters, such as this one on Art Street near Chinatown, the Trocadero. And so I wrote in, a, in an article in 1992 about which I felt, felt a little guilty because I don't believe I had done justice to Durang because it was an example of circular reasoning. Theatrical man makes theatrical buildings, theatrical buildings made by a theatrical man. It didn't so much explain Durang as explain him away. And when I came to collect my dusty old essays and republish them as Philadelphia Builds, which I've got out here if you want one. I thought I would take one last swing through the documents, due diligence, as they say. And it turns out there was something I had missed that I couldn't have found 35 years ago when they had not yet digitized American newspapers of the 19th century. And what I found stunned me. As it happened, Durang did come to architecture through show business, but a different kind of show business not the standard theatrical experience of stage scenery and costume design, he first appeared in Philadelphia as an artist and lithographer in 1848, making satirical political cartoons about the presidential campaign of that year, which he published in lithograph forms in the overwrought, ponderous style of early Victorian caricature. Like this one, which correctly predicted that the election of 1848 would be a democratic funeral. There's Martin Van Buren being carried to his tomb, and there's John C. Calhoun below. 
carrying a set of shackles, appropriately enough, for that champion of slavery. Durang made and sold at least seven of these, but after the election, the market for political cartoons instantly collapsed. Durang moves to Cincinnati, and there he works on that peculiar ancestor of the motion picture, the moving panorama, which is a massive painted backdrop that was slowly unspooled before the audience, accompanied by piano music, song, lecture, dramatic lighting. Durang was one of three artists who created the mammoth panorama of the Mississippi, which had the novelty of showing both sides of the river at once. It doesn't exist having been dragged from Richmond, to, from Cincinnati to Richmond to Washington to Ontario, presumably turning into rags at some point. But we have snippets of it from contemporary lithographs. It was advertised as the largest painting in the world, and I suppose with 45,000 square feet of canvas it was. And Durang would have drawn a great many riverside trees, houses, and churches, and he learned to give them lively and spirited outlines. And having done this, he decided to create his own panorama, the panorama of the New and Old Testaments, 1849, which went from Cincinnati to Louisville to Philadelphia. It's, it's a veritable, venerable showbiz tradition that every commercial success generates a sequel. It's also venerable tradition that the sequel is a flop. And the sequel, Durang's Mirror of Our Country, depicting all the events from the landing of Columbus to the occupation of California in three moving pan panoramas, closed up in 1851. And the final ad shows him eagerly encouraging investors to join his profitable enterprise, a clear sign of failure. <laughs> so what did he get from this? What did he get from this? He got an understanding of architecture that was graphic, visual, buildings that express themselves in oversized and spiky outlines, cupolas, towers, turrets, and spires. This is where he found his language, I suggest, and it even explains why he sometimes gave in to eccentricity when he didn't need it at all. Here is St. James again, uh, West Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania's Catholic Church, which is a perfectly acceptable, if a bit nervous, rendition of a French Gothic cathedral with the inevitable Twin Towers. So it looks today, but it's not how it looked in 1886. <laughs> it's preposterous wow. to take a French cathedral which desperately, poignantly wants to be symmetrical and inflict that top <laughs> upon it. Anyway, let, let's move on from Durang in the interest of time and let me wrap it up with a couple thoughts of Catholic architecture post Durang. Why so much time in Durang? because he gave us the comprehensive fabric of the inner city. It was all in place with this great wave of immigration which petered out and then ended in 1920. So the physical fabric is created. The buildings that follow, and there are splendid ones, tend to be one-offs like gorgeous, exquisite St. Francis de Sales, or are suburban churches, of which there are a great many. Following Durang, most of these churches were designed by Daggett, Henry Daggett, and uh, other, other architects of quality. But what happened is a colossal revulsion against the work of Durang, the fakeness, the artificiality of it, and the essential cheapness of it. These churches had to be built quick, quickly for families with six, eight, 10 or 11 children. They contributed their pennies, but all that could give them was a church of wood and plaster that had be, to be painted into the form of marble and granite. But one church, and it happens to be the church I belong to, St. Patrick's Rittenhouse Square, is, if anything, a built rebuke to Durang. There's the Greek Revival Church of Lebrun, and in 1909, a Philadelphia firm submits this design for a new uh, and large version of St. Patrick's. There's St. Patrick right there, as he should be over the entrance. Perfectly respectable, conventional, predictable entry, but it's not what we got. What we got was a church by the firm of Lafarge and Morris. Grant Lafarge was the son of John Lafarge, the great color painter, creator of our opalescent stained glass window. He had just built St. John the Divine Cathedral in the firm of Lafarge, Heinz and Lafarge. 
Benjamin Wister Morris was also a, a genius of color. Um, he designed the interiors of the Cunard liner, the Queen, Queen Mary. So together, they gave us a church which is itself scrupulously real. Everything about it shows the material itself. Nothing has been painted to, to feign or simulate another material. Gorgeous sense of scale. And the plan is also highly refined. It is a union between a longitudinal plan and a centralizing plan with a transept, a mere ghost of a transept, which on plan, in plan is barely perceptible until you look up and see that it's magnified and enhanced by the Guastavino tile domes. If you're here in Philadelphia still tomorrow morning after mass at the cathedral, it's a 10 minute walk to Rittenhouse Square where I suggest you see it. And what's most extraordinary about it, everything is the real thing, right down to the floor with Mercer tile from Doylestown, Doylestown, Pennsylvania. The walls are brick, the pews are of oak, everything is the real thing. And yet it too is classical in the tradition established by the cathedral in our year of agony, 1844. Well, what do I end you with? I could end you with an unhappy image, but I don't think it's that unhappy. We've had a great contraction in the Catholic population of the city and, alas, a great contraction in the population of Catholic churches. But in some sense, this is the reflection of a success story because this Catholic legacy is the legacy of immigration leading to assimilation, which eventually, inevitably means moving up and out leaving behind the ethnic enclave into which they were confined to be repurposed or, sadly, demolished. Well, this is the American story, and it's a tragic one, but what a stirring one it was. How much energy, how much commitment, how much spirit, how much pluck, how much braveness, bravery, rising from rocky soil to triumph, if only for a moment, on the skyline. Thank you.